I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. On behalf of the National Transit Institute, I welcome you and thank you for participating. The National Transit Institute develops, promotes, and delivers training and education programs for the public transit industry in the United States. <clears throat> today's webinar is based on TCRP Synthesis 127, Addressing Difficult Customer Situations. We are pleased to have as our presenter today, Joel Walensky, former director of the National Center for Transit Research, NCTR, at the University of South Florida. At NCTR, Mr. Walensky managed the largest university-based transit research program in the country. NCTR has produced over 150 reports of direct benefit to operating transit agencies and commuter assistance programs that concentrate primarily on transit planning, operations, and management. The reports he has personally authored have focused on improving the management of transit systems and making them greater community assets. Prior to joining the research faculty at the University of South Florida, Mr. Valinsky was the director of Broward County Transit, the second largest transit system in Florida. From 1983 to 19, oh, there wasn't a period there, there was a comma, sorry. <laughs> he was there from 1983 to 1993. He is the longest serving member in the history of the Board of Directors of the Florida Public Transportation Association, having served in every officer position. He earned his bachelor's degree from the State, of, State University of New York at Albany and his master's degree from Columbia University in Urban Planning. For today's webinar, um, Joel will present his material and uh, we can pause for question and answers. Um, probably, although it's I think there's a point in the middle where we will break for question and answers and there's a spot at the end. However, if you call up the Q&A box, which you can toggle on and off by the control bar, which should be on your window, you can ask your question at any time, but please know that I can't answer your question, most likely, unless it's about handouts or something, and that um, when Joel takes his break in speaking, we will uh, try to go through the open questions. Um, if you haven't printed out a copy of the presentation, I did paste a link at the top of the chat. Uh, if you scroll up, it should be the first thing up there. Uh, if you can't find it, I will try to paste it again. Um, and I guess, I guess uh, that's it. <laughs> I lost my place in my script. I apologize. Um, I'm going to now turn the presentation over to Joel. Joel? And not a second too soon. <laughs> thank you, Mari. And thank you. Um, I see we have 67 participants. I'm presuming they're from all over the country. And uh, welcome you to this presentation. And really appreciate the fact that you uh, have tuned in. And I hope that you'll find that there'll be some useful information for you. Uh, there are also, I believe, opportunities to be able to view this uh, at a later date as well. And uh, if you want to share it with other people that you work with, they can do it at that time. Uh, Laura, speaking for myself, I, was, uh, I really enjoyed the musical uh, introduction, trying to learn how to play lead guitar. I was loving it, and I was waiting for some Howlin' Wolf or some other uh, Led Zeppelin or something. Anyway, I enjoyed it a great deal. Thank you for, for doing that. And uh, so let's turn right now to the uh, subject at hand, which is, as Laurie mentioned, addressing difficult customer situations. Uh, on occasion, I'm going to lapse into saying difficult passenger situations. It's a, kind of one of the same, although the um, presentation will be of primary interest to uh, supervisors within operations of a transit agency, but also marketing people, uh, customer service personnel, uh, other, other managers throughout a transit agency, and perhaps even board of directors. So, uh, Laura, if you could go ahead to the next slide. Sure. Um, Joel, I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm getting feedback that uh, asking if you could speak a little louder. Uh, um, all right. I'll, I'll move the mic down a little bit as yeah, well. Yeah, move the mic down a little bit and speak a little louder. I think that will help. Okay. Uh, is this noticeably different, better, I hope? I think it's a little better. Um, I'll wait for feedback in the, um, the chat box, but uh, mm -hmm. I've advanced the slides, so. Okay, very good. All right. Well, as Laurie had mentioned, this is a project that ultimately resulted in a report produced by the TCRP program, which I presume most of you are familiar with. The uh, TCRP program has produced by now many hundreds of reports that deal with uh, a variety of issues that transit agencies deal with. And in this case, <clears throat> it was a synthesis, synthesis project versus what they call a full-blown 
project, which is one that's usually done in less than a year's time uh, for a relatively small amount of money, unfortunately, but it's a, a real joy to work on them because I can collect and synthesize information from all over the country and in some cases all over the world, and uh, it is uh, available to you free of charge, which is a great thing. All of the TCRP reports are governed by a panel made up of transit managers and other researchers uh, to ensure its quality and to ensure that it's being produced and, and uh, written in a way that the scope of service is called for. And this particular report was published in 2017. So it's slightly dated, uh, but I think that all of the information in it is still pertinent and I hope you find it useful. Uh, next slide, Larry. The uh, purpose of the report is, was, as it mentions here, to try to identify how transit agencies deal with difficult customer situations, how they anticipate them developing, how they try to prevent them from occurring in the first place. But if they do happen, then how do they respond to it and how do they counter the incident once it's in place? <clears throat> the definition of difficult customer situations are when customers are engaging in activity that makes transit personnel or customers feel unsafe or uncomfortable. Next slide, Lori. Joel, um, some people are still saying they're having some problems hearing you. I don't, um, I don't know if it's the connection or uh -oh. there is a little bit of an echoey kind of sound, but it might just be um, I hadn't yeah. noticed when we practiced, or just maybe try to talk a little louder or, or turn the volume up maybe. Well, I'm, I'm looking at if I have a volume button on the speaker, I don't think <laughs> I do. Um, and I'm almost yelling as it is. So, oh, okay. Uh, uh, I, I, I truly apologize. I, I don't know if there's anything at your end, Dory, that you could do to jack up the uh, I volume. don't, I mean, I can try to make, I don't think making my computer louder is going to, Help because I think it's um, it's occurring on your end. It might be the connection. Um, I think it got better towards the end, though. So just uh, okay. just speak up. Sorry. Okay, I've got it set on high. That's okay. the best I can do. And, okay. Uh, all right. So we're going to talk about uh, what are some of the examples of difficult passenger situations. We have to have a sort of a definition for it, and, and these examples provide type of, of situations that are commonly occurring. Uh, they don't occur all the time on every, every trip, but they're not exactly rare. They do happen. And uh, one of the more common ones, especially these days with everybody owning a cell phone, it seems, is when people speak too loudly on their phone or that they have music that they're carrying with them in one instrument or another that is too loud and it's somewhat bothersome to other people. Uh, clearly things like spitting or urinating or any other disgusting things that may be going on uh, inside a facility or inside a vehicle it is a difficult situation. Uh, when you have angry customers who get quite argumentative, uh, whether they're frustrated or for whatever reason, they can be very loud and uh, disturbing. Or you have customers who uh, uh, have obsessive compulsive behavior or other mental or emotional disorders that are having uh, this opportunity to act out in the, in the bus, in the train, in the, in the station, uh, at the bus uh, terminal. You also, of course, have customers who are sometimes intoxicated or under the influence of either drugs or alcohol. What we find is it's usually more under the influence of alcohol that becomes the problem. And um, Customers that have noxious odors, either on their person or their clothes or, or something else. Uh, customers that become quite abusive and start harassing other passengers or the vehicle operator and start making threats. You have others that uh, may be engaging in some kind of disruptive behavior, not necessarily interacting with the bus operator or train conductor, but they are, are, are misbehaving in one way or another. Uh, on the vehicle or at the uh, transit facility. And then perhaps the most serious uh, and difficult is the when a, an assault occurs, either on a passenger or on an uh, employee of the transit system, and actual fights break out. So those are some of the examples. There are more, but those are, gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Next slide, Larry. 
So we ask, uh, why is this subject important? And I think that it's, it's probably relatively self-evident, but that um, a transit agency's core mission is safety, just like an airline's core mission is to get people to their destination without any incidents, without any unsafe conditions. And so <clears throat> uh, people would stop using a transit uh, agency service if they felt like it was unsafe uh, with any great frequency. And by and large, transit passengers are just regular people, salt of the earth people. They just want to get where they're going, and they don't want to have to uh, engage in any kind of unpleasant behaviors or, or be uh, assaulted with them. They don't want to be fearful of getting on the vehicle or staying at the station. And they want no drama. They just want to get to their destination without incident. And these days, as I mentioned earlier, with everybody seeming to have a cell phone, Another real problem for transit systems is that it used to be back in the day that if something happened on board a bus or, or a train, the only people that really knew about it were the people that were on that bus or that train that day. But now people can take a snapshot, they can take a video, and whatever they capture on board that vehicle or at the station is suddenly something people can see in China 30 seconds later. And these sort of things are not the sort of things that a transit agency really wants to have out there being broadcast to a far bigger audience. Next slide. The uh, incidence of difficult customer situations can definitely negatively impact ridership. And uh, I show here that there was one British study that uh, took a look at those sort of incidents, and they found after they interviewed people that the ridership on their system could have increased by 11% if there were no difficult customer situations, the type of which we just described. But there were others that also reported it, and uh, Long Beach Transit, for instance, found out that one half of 1% of the people who had discontinued riding said they discontinued because of their uh, feelings of, of uh, lack of personal safety much of which is caused by these sort of uh, difficult situations that take place in the transit system. Uh, Mountain Line Transit out in Montana also received calls from seniors in particular who said that they were no longer going to ride the system because they felt unsafe within the vehicles due to other passenger activity. The uh, small transit system in northern Arizona got a lot of calls from parents who said they would not let their children ride the buses because of the um, uh, incidents that have been occurring, and uh, uh, Tank, the transit system in northern Kentucky, also said that they lost half their ridership on one of their park and ride services after the composition of the ridership changed and it resulted in having more people who were more boisterous and loud, and so those who had choices, as, as they often do on park and rides, just said, we're not going to use this service anymore, it's just not, uh, it's not comfortable to be here. And I would say that 90% that of all of the respondents to the survey for this project agreed that, uh, that it can negatively impact ridership. And even though we don't have great data and statistics on it, most of it is anecdotal, uh, they were pretty much all in agreement that, yeah, this is a serious issue that can, that can result in reduced ridership. And we know that because we get feedback through phone calls, through emails, social media, when we attend community meetings. And they know that it hurts the image of transit. And so they would like to do everything they can to prevent it, to counter it, and uh, make it as minimal as possible. Yeah, next slide, Larry. The methodology for this report was, as is usually the case with all TCRP, project, TCRP projects, that a, a literature search was done, and that includes uh, going to the TRID and the TRIS databases, which have thousands of scholarly articles and papers that are uh, there to be researched with keywords. But we also went through transit journals, whether it was you know, Mass Transit Magazine or, or other kinds of e-zines that maybe some of you subscribe to and receive in your, in your email. Uh, we looked at those. We also uh, did a, a complete search with every internet a search engine you can think of, whether it was Google or Bing, and tried to, again, enter keywords and see what we could find in terms of any kind of articles and newspapers from around the country that would bring you more 
perhaps up-to-date information on what's going on. But perhaps the most important uh, source of information for the findings in this report came from a survey that was sent to 49 different transit agencies around the country. Uh, actually, a letter went out first, an email to uh, more than 200 transit agencies asking if they would like to participate in this project, and 49 said that they would. I know there's a lot of uh, fatigue with surveys out there in the industry, and I, I'm not surprised when people say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do this one, uh, but I'm looking forward to the results. But uh, we did get 49 that said that they would like to participate. Next slide, Blair. Now, the 49 that said that they would participate, we did get uh, full responses from 41 of them. And uh, it was uh, a, a real rich amount of information that we received, these 23 different questions. And the respondents came from a good cross-section of the country, and we'll see that in the map in just a moment. But they came from 20 different states and the District of Columbia. And it was a good cross-section of the geographic uh, area of the United States. Uh, or of the um, size of transit systems, where 14 were, were small systems with less than 100 vehicles, 16 were mid-sized transit systems with between 100 and 500 vehicles, and 11 were systems that were quite large with over 500 vehicles. Right? And here uh, you see a, a map that shows you the location of the various respondents, and you can see that, as I say, it was a pretty good cross-section of the country. They came from the north and the south, the east and the west and the middle, and over the uh, <clears throat> uh, participants described and listed uh, at the bottom of the, of the slide. And uh, whenever I uh, mention something in the report, I usually try to say it was something that was provided to us by Transit System X or Y. So that if you wanted to, as you read the report, you could go and contact them if you wanted more follow-up information to find out more. Lori? Now, one of the first questions we asked was, uh, what are the most difficult and the most frequent difficult customer situations? Um, and what we found out was that there was a distinct uh, consensus, it seemed, that fare disputes, probably to no one's real surprise, tends to be the issue that creates the most problems that their, their uh, vehicle operators have to deal with. And next was customers that have a variety of types of mental health issues. Very difficult to deal with people that perhaps aren't going to be rational. Uh, after that, it was customers under the influence of alcohol and sometimes under the influence of, of different drugs. Uh, others that you see here listed are rudeness of customers, that uh, the, the bus operator has to deal with profanity and verbal abuse. And you also get a lot of customers that are just upset when a bus is late, and for good reason, uh, which we'll mention in a, in a few minutes, uh, that they might miss their connection. They are, they are very upset. Uh, the next most um, frequent, even though it's probably the most difficult, would be assaults on operators. Uh, Fortunately, they're still relatively rare, but they do happen. And when they do happen, they're terrifically serious, as you, as you all know. Then there's a student, a disruptive student behavior, which perhaps is becoming a little bit more common because in some communities, yellow bus service provided by schools is no longer provided due to their own budget difficulties with the school districts. And so the public transit system has become the, uh, the way that students often get around, and that has resulted in more incidents of uh, misbehavior by students on, on transit systems. And the next one is, is when a passenger gets on with poor hygiene. Uh, and this is often associated with the homeless, as, as I'm sure you can guess. And then conflicts with uh, regard to ADA issues. Uh, people might think, hey, wait a minute, uh, is that really a service? Is that boa constrictor really a service animal? or, or arguments about priority seating inside the bus for people, uh, the elderly or people that are disabled, or a lack of space for bus uh, bike racks, those sort of things. And there, there are many more, but those are the ones that tended to be brought up the most. Lori? Then we asked the questions, are incidents of difficult customer situations increasing or decreasing? And Six of them said, we really, we just don't know. We don't keep data on this. And in fact, 
uh, almost no agency really had good data because they don't keep records of something called, quote, difficult customer situations, unquote. Uh, this was a, a new definition based on this study, but not one that is kept for uh, any kind of reporting purposes to the federal government. Uh, I did find that, that PSTA in the St. Petersburg, Florida, and Long Beach Transit in the LA area uh, had, the, had the best record keeping for things of this nature, but even theirs were still evolving and in development. Now, in answering the questions, are, are these situations increasing or decreasing? 14 said, uh, or, or are they increasing? They said no. Uh, and a few even said that they were actually decreasing. And I asked, well, if that's the case, why would you think they are decreasing? And uh, there were different reasons given by different uh, transit agencies. Uh, Star Metro in Tallahassee, Florida said that well, our operators wear uniforms that look very much like police uniforms. And they think that at least within the transit facility where the operators are walking around, it gives the sense that there's more uniform security there and it might also uh, have an impact on someone who's entering a bus for the first time when they see somebody in a uniform of that type. Um, other agencies said that the rider suspension policy that's based on uh, trespass warrants has been very, very effective for them. Usually that's the most effective in the smaller agencies or mid-sized agencies, and they find that that policy has helped remove the worst offenders and when you can remove the worst offenders and, and ban them from your system, at least temporarily or, or permanently, you've helped to reduce those uh, difficult customer situations. Uh, one real good point made was that technology that we now have that provides real-time bus arrival information is extremely helpful in terms of lessening the tension that passengers feel, and it allows them even if the bus is late, it allows them the opportunity to make some alternative, take some alternative actions. I mean, they could bite the bullet and get an Uber or a Lyft if they really had to get someplace fast. But it keeps them posted on the status of the service. And instead of just stewing and getting angry, they have they know, okay, here's the situation. Uh, and, and the Twitter accounts that some transit agencies keep <clears throat> now allows uh, them to communicate this to their passengers who are plugged into the service and it helps to reduce the uncertainty and the anger that a passenger might feel when they their bus is late. At least they can, you know, the transit agency can say our deepest apologies, our, one of our vehicles is delayed, we expect it to be there in so many minutes and it helps to diffuse some of the anger and tension. Uh, and, and lastly, one of the agencies said that, well, you know, we think that it's actually uh, difficult customer situations are, are decreasing because a lot of our passengers are just under smartphones the entire trip. They're not watching what's going on. They don't care what's going on in the rest of the bus. They're occupied with their own phone calls. Uh, next uh, slide, Mark. However, uh, the majority, small majority of the system said yes. Uh, we think that difficult customer situations are increasing, and they gave a number of reasons that they think it uh, that was the case that uh, there seem to be more people uh, on the streets now with mental health issues. Perhaps they've been discharged from certain kind of mental health facilities and released into, into uh, community, um, uh, in, back into the community, and they're now more of uh, people with those issues that will tend to use the system from time to time. <clears throat> and they can create some, some difficult situations. They also cited a, 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 an increasing number of homeless. And when the homeless use the transit system, this sometimes makes other passengers feel uncomfortable for any variety of reasons. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are some transit agencies now, uh, certainly in Rochester this is happening, and in Long Beach as well, where there is no more yellow school bus service. Uh, their districts are, are run out of money, they're cutting back in different ways. And uh, the transit system is now carrying uh, students to school back and forth. And with students, you know, you get a lot of youthful energy, you get a lot of excitement, uh, not necessarily negative, it's just that's the way they are, but that the way they are tends to make other people feel uncomfortable sometimes. Uh, I mentioned a moment ago too that there can be um, anger over insufficient wheelchair spaces where you're not gonna be able to pick up a passenger uh, when, when they expect to be picked up at the bus stop 
might have to wait for some special service to come, or that there aren't enough uh, bike rack uh, spaces as bike uh, uh, bus service tends to become much more popular. And one of the things that I think every transit agency has to realize is that uh, a lot of the difficult passenger situations could be can be avoided with the highest quality service possible, because poor service quality causes passengers to vent. Uh, if there's a bus that's late, hey, that means they may be late to work, and if they're late to work a few too many times, they lose their job, they might miss their doctor's appointments, or miss a, a class or a test that they need to take. They might be late for picking up their child from daycare. Uh, they have important things to do, and of course, they're relying on us on transit services to get them there and back. So uh, whenever there's poor service quality, uh, there there is the increased possibility of having difficult passenger situations because they're angry. And uh, another one reported that they had gone through a transit work stoppage uh, in the not too distant past. And when that happened, a number of people did lose their jobs. They lost their ability to get to work. And of course, when that happens, you can't expect somebody getting on a bus to be smiley and happy to the bus operator when they finally do come back to the service, they're going to be venting and uh, angry at the bus operator, and that's a difficult thing. Before we go to the next slide, I, I, when we talk about the homeless uh, in that one of those bullets above, uh, I do want to mention, too, that there is a TCRP report um, on transit and their interactions with the homeless that would give you far more in-depth information on this whole subject. It's TCRP Synthesis 121, and I would highly recommend it to, uh, to anyone that uh, wants to know more about that subject. And uh, lastly, I would say that um, another reason for increased uh, problems uh, or difficult situations is that uh, in California, they passed a new state law which allowed people to be released from prison in, uh, sooner than they normally would if they were, uh, their sentences were reduced. And, and now you have people that may or may not you know, be troublemakers in the future, but they're out there and they may be using the transit system uh, more than they used to. Okay. Uh, Lori, why don't we stop here for just a moment and ask if there might be any questions that I, I could answer. Um, sure, we can. I did have a question slide inserted. Um, oh, okay. I mean, okay. let me, want me to see where it is? <laughs> Oh, no, uh, I no, mean, there no. is one question. Well, since we stopped anyway, do you want to, I can read uh, Kurt's question. Okay. Uh, it, it says, uh, I don't know if you have your Q&A box open, but it says, commuters often risk their lives by ignoring pedestrian safety gates while trains are approaching stations, station trespassing. My, computer, my commuter line refuses to require such rule breakers to take the next train, despite that being the result had they obeyed the rules. They are a quasi-government agency and believe their form of organization subjects, subjects them to lawsuits for denying a citizen's right to travel. Is this fear of lawsuits reasonable? <laughs> this is what, I did not come across that in my research. I hate to, I hate to take a, the out on that, but I, I, I can't give you any good information based on, on uh, having read on, uh, about this subject. So I, I'm terribly sorry I can't answer that one. Okay. Sorry, Kurt. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess there's no more open questions right now. Okay. We can stop when I, I, I believe I inserted a slide for questions. Okay. I, I hope I don't oh. make a liar of myself, but. Um, well, let's go to the next slide. Then. Okay. <laughs> so when I gathered all this information from the 41 agencies that responded, I tried to synthesize the main um, ways to address difficult customer situations, to help to anticipate them, avoid them, uh, prevent them, and then if you have to deal with them, to deal with them. And they come down to these five basic categories. And, that, and we'll go in each one uh, into, into more depth on each one. And the first is education and community outreach, which we'll describe in a, in a moment. The second one is to make sure you have established rules of conduct, and, and, uh, and that you also have things such as trespass warrants that would allow you to take people out of your system if they, the actions they've taken have warrants with that. The third is the training of transit personnel, so critical uh, in the development of clear procedures for them uh, to be able to follow and understand 
when they're out there in the field, which is usually on their own, uh, it's so critical to have uh, appropriate training for them so that they're prepared. The fourth is the use of uh, different types of technology, which we'll go over in a little bit greater length. And then the fifth and last would be law enforcement of different types uh, when it's necessary if the transit agency with their own personnel and their own procedures can't handle it. So next slide, Larry. So dealing with education and outreach, there are a number of ways that transit systems can, can stay in touch with their communities. And uh, one of the, uh, some of the ways are to uh, meet with people in the community at a variety of types of, of fairs. A lot of times it's type of fairs that deal with environmental issues or healthy living, something that transit systems think they have a natural relationship with. <clears throat> Or you can meet with neighborhood associations of different kinds, uh, go to senior centers and uh, make presentations, attend PTA events, uh, uh, church meetings as well. There are uh, a, a lot of opportunities to get out there and meet people face to face uh, on the trans out there in San Bernardino, California, indicated that they go to uh, 80 such, such events per year. So there's plenty of opportunities to do that. And with this education and outreach, uh, what you're trying to do is to, to teach people um, appropriate behavior and the rules of the road, call it what you will, transit etiquette. Uh, and there's many uh, different materials you can use, whether it's printed brochures, whether it's uh, videos, uh, whether it's just PowerPoint presentations, uh, lots of different ways to be able to share this information with the general public that you are, are addressing. The uh, third bullet talks about uh, attending schools, uh, and again, more important in those communities where uh, the transit system has effectively become the public uh, bus system for schools, and to uh, uh, go there when kids are registering for school year, uh, back to school nights to talk with the parents as well as the students. Uh, WMATA reported that they used their transit police to uh, go and participate in a, something that they call Respect Your Ride program. And in it, they share all of the uh, rules of the road with the, uh, with the kids and tell them what appropriate behavior is on a bus and what inappropriate behavior is. Um, some of the transit systems reported that they, uh, they, uh, they have some of the school kids take field trips to the transit agency, come actually onto the property uh, and, and be able to talk with, with transit managers there and learn about the, the system and learn about appropriate behavior using the system. Uh, while another agency in Omtran uh, in Florida said they take their buses to summer camps. And summer camps are always looking for activities for the kids because they got them for however many weeks. They <laughs> need to keep them occupied. Uh, and they find that it's a good opportunity to, uh, to be able to address the kids there in a way that they hope with the actual bus there, it'll, it might stay in their memory a little bit better. Uh, Omnitrans does something similar, and they actually have a specially equipped bus that is used for hands-on training for new bus operators. Uh, and they find that that's been pretty effective for them. The um, uh, agencies have also produced YouTube videos uh, that they can they can just post on on the internet generally, but they also have them on their website, and they invite people to watch this. And PSTA said that it was their most uh, frequently watched. Uh, thing on their website or their or their videos on on how to ride the bus. So, Lori, next uh, next slide. In addition to all those things I just described, uh, a few agencies have gotten into some kind of campaigns that uh, end up with placards on the inside of rail cars or the inside of, of buses that uh, remind people. Uh, and I know sometimes they're. Uh, they're difficult. They can be a little bit thick-headed, but that hey, you know, don't be so loud with your with your uh, music playing. You've got earbuds for a reason. Um, you know that it's it's rude to be eating uh, in in the uh, vehicle, or that uh, nobody's interested in your conversation. And it just drives us all crazy when people feel they have to shout phones. So things of this nature, uh, they find have been at least a little bit helpful as reminders to people. Next slide. 
Huh. Okay, this is okay, see, <laughs> that's where I put the question slide. And actually, one question did come in, so we should okay. probably, um, it's from Tolly. <laughs> it says, have you ever reached out to Canadian transit agencies to see if this data is the same for us northern partners? <laughs> well, again, the data is not very uh, good. You know, because nobody really keeps track of this thing called difficult customer situations. I mean, they might keep track of the salts, or they might keep track of uh, one or two other things specifically, but they don't really have something that you can just press a button and get a printout of, of your difficult situations. And it's too bad they don't, because if you did know what they were, where they were happening, then you could deploy your personnel, if you have any kind of security personnel, to those locations at certain times of day to help um, uh, address them or prevent them from happening to begin with. But uh, to answer the question, of, did we reach out to Canadian transit agencies for this? We did not. Uh, I apologize. We didn't um, send the survey to, to Canadian systems. Uh, we were getting some pretty good information from the U.S. systems, and, and we thought we, were, we had enough to, to go with the report at that point. And then I see a question, are we allowed to use the posters from the slides? Hmm. Well, that's a good question, and uh, I don't know if they have some sort of uh, uh, restriction from using them. Uh, if you would like uh, to send me an email, uh, I'll be happy to, to uh, communicate with those agencies and get back to you to see if they would say, yeah, don't worry about it, you can do it. They might say no. I mean, they probably paid many thousands of dollars to some PR company to put them together and to produce them and what have you. Uh, on the other hand, most transit agencies are pretty generous with what they develop and they, they share things, but I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I will be happy to uh, give a call. This was, I think a lot of these came from Chicago, the Chicago Transit Authority, and uh, you could reach out to them and ask them if, if they could be used. I, I definitely think the, the images on the slides as they are probably much too small to do anything with. Uh, might be. Uh, I don't know if they could be expanded. Um, Usually you can't go up. It loses resolution. But um, yeah, they should probably reach out and ask if they can use them. Or, you know, search the internet. Maybe they can find a larger version. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> uh, and, and now we've got another question yes. from Mark. Uh, were there any insights on which departments led various outreach campaigns for wider education and, and engagement? And, um, you know, there are, um, it's usually within the marketing and community relations departments that do that. Uh, they're the ones who will go out and spend time at community meetings. They're the ones who will try to get this kind of, uh, these kind of pictures developed so that they can be then put on, on uh, inside the vehicles or at the uh, transit facilities. Uh, and, and so typically it is uh, either uh, community relations or marketing department. Uh, we have another question. Um, yeah, before you get to yeah. Price's question, there is a question uh, from Jeff in the chat box. It says, um, according to federal guidelines, in what instances can we refuse ridership? Soiled clothing, ADA space is taken, etc." Well, what I was hearing from the respondents is that uh, so many of these things, and it's a terrible answer because it doesn't give the answer you're looking for, is it's kind of case by case. Uh, and you have to... Um, rely on the good judgment of your vehicle operator typically as to whether or not what they are wearing or how they are you know, presenting themselves is a danger or a, an extreme inconvenience to other people. And uh, if it is, you know, at that point, the vehicle operator is typically advised to call dispatch and get, get uh, some guidance on this who would uh, offer their opinion based on what the operator of the vehicle is telling them. And if they need supervisory um, review of that, they will try to get a supervisor out to the vehicle as soon as they possibly can. Um, I am not familiar with uh, any particular federal law that, that deals with this. Uh, no one really addressed that in their, in their responses. Uh, they were more concerned with just the fact that, hey, we've got someone here who, um, you know, may be creating a disturbance for other people and may be something that's going to discourage people from using the transit system in the future, can we do something about it? And I think one of the things to remember is that it's not being homeless or being drunk is not illegal. Uh, 
no operator really has the right to deny entry to a vehicle unless people have received a trespass warrant. And so, um, you know, if you see somebody that's outside the bus and they're bleeding or there's definitely, you know, some kind of fluid that you can see on their clothes or on themselves, um, you could probably stop the bus at least momentarily and call for call the dispatcher and say, you know, I'd like to deny service to this person. Uh, but you really need to get that approval first. And as much as we trust the operators to make the right decision, uh, that's the right decision at that moment for that bus operator to get further guidance. Um, there is a question from Price in the Q&A okay. box. Let do you want me to read it or can do you see it? Uh, I'll tell you in a moment. Okay. Christ. Oh, okay. Is there literature on how drivers or staff members handle problem passengers once they have caused a problem? Uh, fair conflicts are a very common problem. The driver has a few options, none of them great. You know, let them go in, whether they're paying or not, or paying the wrong amount, to argue with the customer and hold up the bus or call the police. I think that what we're finding around the country um, is that we're <clears throat> Typically, only 20% of what um, pays for a transit operation is coming from the care box, and about 80% of it is subsidized from a variety of sources. And that number can vary as low as 6% or as high as 30%. But the point is that one fare is not going to make or break a, a transit system. And uh, what you want to do as a bus operator is to um, ask the person, uh, do you not have the appropriate fare? Uh, if you don't have it today, please bring it tomorrow. Uh, next time you ride, here is the appropriate fare, and give them a brochure that, that reminds them of what the appropriate fare is and ask them to take a seat. Now, I know that's frustrating because obviously there are grifters out there that are always trying to get away with something. But if you know that that same person is typically using the system and you report it to, to uh, your transit agency that, hey, I'm, I've seen this same person here day after day, then you call a supervisor and have them meet with that person and uh, have them talk it through and see if there's something that can be done. Uh, I mean, I know that there's all sorts of instances of people coming on with a $20 bill, knowing that there's not any change given and they're told to sit down, or they'll come on with a bus that's a youth pass and they're 50 years old, you know that's not right. But you don't ever, ever want to get into an argument over it. You just want to advise them of what the policy is, uh, remind them to have the correct fare next time, make a note of it, maybe even timestamp it, and then ask the person to sit down. I know the frustration because other passengers are watching and you think that, oh, they're going to be very mad and they're not going to pay next time. But fortunately for us, the vast, vast majority of passengers are, are just good people. They're not looking to you know, save a $2 on a bus fare because somebody else, you know, didn't have the money at that point. They have a pretty good appreciation for the value of the transit system, and they know they've got to contribute to its upkeep. Um, and they're not going to suddenly start not paying because one person didn't. So um, that's the way that's typically uh, held now. Again, it was noted as the most frequent, and some said the most difficult, um, customer uh, situation that, that uh, transit agencies um, experience. I think it's the most frequent, but I don't think it's the most difficult um, because you, you don't want your driver getting into an argument and you just want to keep the bus service moving and you don't want your driver getting hurt. And you don't want anybody else getting hurt. And that's the way that uh, most people have said that they deal with it. Um, it looks like Nicole asked in the chat box, do all the other transit agencies on here have their own code of conduct posted and enforce it? Okay, I guess that was, she was asking um, everybody in the chat box. Is that right, Nicole? Oh. <laughs> if there's any more questions for Joel at this point, you can type it in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Wait another couple of seconds to see if anybody's typing. And then I guess we'll move on. And, and I would say this, uh, uh, Lori, that um, 
yeah, I, everybody's got some code of conduct. And we, in fact, we're going to talk about that in just, just a minute. There it is. Boom. Yep, there it is. It's like magic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, these are very important for every transit agency to have and important for them to be adopted by their board of directors or their commissions or whoever is the uh, governing body. Um, they provide what we refer to as the rules of the road that, uh, that gives it, it sets a floor for appropriate behavior uh, and probably a ceiling for inappropriate behavior. Uh, and uh, you need to have that because it gives you then the legal authority that you need when you have to intervene in one of these situations. If you don't have something that's there in writing and it's been adopted by the agency, then a bus operator or a train conductor or whoever uh, might be, might be uh, criticized for being arbitrary in whatever they do, but they aren't being arbitrary. They're following the rules and the code of conduct, and they're sharing them with the passengers, with the customers. Um, and, and the other important thing besides adopting them is to make sure that people know about them. And so there's a lot of effort put into placing these rules of conduct either on placards inside the bus, you know, we used to call it the, the no placard, you know, no eating, no drinking, no spitting, no whatever. But they have to be there and visible. Uh, you can put those same rules in your transit guides, on your schedules uh, that are handed out. People are still using schedules these days um, instead of just the internet. Uh, on their website, you can have them on posters that are placed in any number of different places. You can have them on digital displays at your transit terminals or even on the, uh, on the bus or the train. Put them in brochures that you can hand to a passenger that is being difficult. And you can say, look, I am just advising you of what the rules are. Be, be uh, advised that this is what uh, you can and cannot do. And uh, you don't get into a big argument about it. And you can then, and we'll talk about this in a little too, you can then say, and by the way, we are being recorded and just want you to know that you've been advised of what the rules are. Uh, so uh, there's that, and then, and as I said, the point is to make sure that there's no excuses, that passengers can say, oh, I didn't know. Well, and maybe they're brand new and they never did see it and they don't know, but for the most part, you're trying to take that excuse away from them and eliminate those claims that a transit employee is just uh, flying back by the seat of his or her pants and being arbitrary in uh, rule enforcement because the rules are there, they've been adopted, they're in, in place, and we are sharing them with you. And uh, this, this uh, list of prohibited activities in the code of conduct can be kind of brief. I've seen some that only have about 10 or 12, and then I've seen one that has about 50, and probably it could be 100 if they've really thought of everything they've ever seen. But uh, the point is, you want to keep it brief enough so that people don't tune out and, and that you cover the most important things, but you might want to have a secondary list as well for those folks that maybe are doing the things that aren't done as frequently. Uh, next slide. And the examples of prohibited behavior, as I said, can be very, very long, and it includes all of these things, of, you know, not to drink, not to smoke. Um, on the drinking, you know, in some cases, there's a little bit, there's a little bit more leniency if you've got a, a bottle with a cap on it. Uh, as long as you got to keep the cap on, you can bring the drink in <clears throat> and be careful with it but certainly they don't want smoking and they don't want eating for a number of reasons. Um, you're trying to tone down the, the volume on conversations or music. Uh, don't really want people using all kinds of profanity or, 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 or insulting people, et cetera. Um, you don't want uh, animals, with the exception of legitimate service animals coming on board. Uh, I know some states nowadays with the crazy you know, gun uh, interest we've got in this country, they may have some state laws that say you can uh, bring a, a, a weapon uh, on board, but most transit agencies do their best to say no, you know, weapons are not allowed. You can't bring them on, on board a vehicle uh, or any other kind of combustible materials that could end up with a fire or an explosion. Things like littering and spitting, all these things that you see on the screen, uh, they are listed on the code of conduct and uh, Letting people know that, hey, these are things that are not um, tolerated, not, not appropriate, and uh, we can take action if you are engaging in any such action. And uh, when that is the case, then agencies uh, can have graduated prohibitions 
for repeat offenders. It, it isn't that, hey, you're off the system forever, but you could be suspended for a day, for a week, for a month, for a year. And uh, this is the sort of thing that is uh, very serious, of course, because this is a public service. And it's a public service that, thankfully for us, many people rely upon and use. And if they can't use it again, they might not be able to get to work or get to wherever they're going in their lives. And so you have to provide an appeals um, process for them. And this process can be um, you know, two or three steps long. And usually it, it's um, involving the passenger coming in to talk with the operations manager and trying to find out the, uh, the reason that the passenger did what they did. And try to find out if they are truly apologetic and contrite how sincere are they in saying, yeah, uh, hey, I, I crossed the line, I'm sorry, I, that's, I was having a bad day, whatever the case may be. They need to get a good feel for why this person uh, is making his, his or her case for being able to use the system again. But extremely important that they have that opportunity to appeal a decision of suspension or complete termination. Next slide, Mark. Now training, is what some people call the, the first line of defense to deal with difficult customer situations. Uh, I mean, you might argue that it's the marketing and the uh, provision of information, but um, transit agencies spend a great deal of time and money training their personnel on how to avoid confrontation. Uh, that's really the key. And, and the object is to, regardless of how that person's acting, when they get on board a vehicle uh, or at the, or at the station or calling the customer service center, the object is to always stay calm, positive, be courteous, even though you might be screaming inside yourself, I really like to strangle this person. You've got to stay on a neutral platform, be professional, don't take anything personally because they don't know you anyway. They're, they're, uh, they're venting and you don't want to get what they say, emotionally hijacked. You've got to maintain a certain level of emotional intelligence, as they call it. So be very careful about your tone of voice and don't do anything that leads to a response that is uh, gonna escalate things. A number of systems talked about practicing what they call verbal judo, which means you know, trying to deflect and redirect whatever aggression is coming toward them verbally and to not ever point the finger at the other person and use, you know, you language and you're wrong and you did this, you did that. But, you know, try to say, you know, I have this responsibility and here are the rules and try to keep it non-personal in that way. Try to keep it kind of objective. And there's a lot that goes into this uh, that I can't provide you all with this um, on this webcast. But it's, it's a little science in itself and, and people would, would be well advised to learn more about it. Now, uh, a number of agencies uh, do provide um, a lot of different types of training for people to be able to stay calm when everything around them is getting a little crazy. And they give stress management training, uh, try to keep telling them, leave your problems at home if you've got problems, that's where they are, now you're here, and you, you have to uh, uh, behave differently right now and not worry about whatever other problems you have. They even get into breathing techniques, uh, and, and, and uh, one property in Via in San Antonio says that they provide massage service on their property for bus operators that just feel like they've had it. You know, they, need, they need something, they need some help to get them refocused and centered. And so they can get a 15 minute neck and shoulder massage just to kind of help calm them down and to learn how to use breathing techniques to help calm them down. There is a lot of training available around the country, uh, whether it's through the Transportation Safety Institute or, or NTI, uh, Easter Seals, or, or any number of private companies that can be hired to come in and provide this sort of training on diffusing and de-escalating situations. And uh, uh, they often use videos, uh, do role playing, go into case studies, they have group discussion, uh, and, and these are terrific ways of helping uh, all of the personnel that you're concerned with be able to really work through these situations, more so than reading a report. You know, if you're there with some of your peers and they're saying, here's the situations we've been dealing with and here's how I dealt with it and it worked or it didn't work, 
uh, it's great to get that kind of information. Uh, and then whatever you come up with, it can be put up on posters around the facility of the uh, transit system to help remind people to, to stay professional and courteous and positive. And that um, uh, this is also an area, this type of training, where management and labor unions can really work together. I mean, often there's a, a difficult situation between management and labor unions, but this is not one of them. This is where everybody has a common objective. Hey, we want everybody to be safe. We want our system to be attractive. Uh, let's work together to try to help make that happen. And let's do it with some frequency. Let's not just do it once in your career as a bus operator and, and then that's it. No, do it every at least every two years. Maybe every year if you can, if you can afford it. I know these training sessions take people away and you have to use uh, the extra board and all that. It gets a little bit more expensive, but it's worth it. Uh, one other thing that the PSTA mentioned to us down in, in uh, St. Petersburg is that they provide uh, a position uh, named Coaching and Performance Development Manager who has an office right outside the bus operator's room that they can all go into whenever they are feeling these kind of stresses. And they can talk it through with this manager who's right there. I mean, they can't miss them. And uh, not everyone takes advantage of that resource, but but many do. And they found that it's been helpful, and the operators have, have said so as well. Next slide, Larry. Then we get into the other uh, category of technology. How do how can we use certain technologies as we try to prevent, avoid, and deal with difficult passenger or customer situations? And the first one, which is almost, well, not almost, it was universally reported that's being used, are security cameras uh, on board vehicles, uh, at, at transit terminals, at stations, park and ride facilities. They are ubiquitous and uh, very important to have. Um, there are, are signs that are put up on uh, at the facilities or on the vehicles, letting people know that, hey, we do have these cameras. I mean, it's good to have the cameras, but if people don't know that they're there, it's not as effective as when they do know they're there. Uh, you can encourage your personnel to point to the cameras when someone is acting out and let them know that, hey, you know, <laughs> here are the rules. And I just want to remind you, this is all being recorded, uh, videotaped. So please, you know, take that into consideration as we move forward. Uh, in addition to helping to diffuse the situation, we hope, the cameras then help to apprehend the offenders. Uh, you've got a picture of them. You, you've got eyewitnesses, but you've also got the video, which is uh, very important and helps the police, local police, to be able to apprehend uh, these offenders and, and uh, bring them in so that the transit system can, can say, hey, you know, we, we've got to give you a suspension because of this. And the video information that's collected from the cameras are make excellent training tools. It's uh, one of the best things to be able to take into your training session and say, hey, here's what happened on this day. Let's see how, how it developed. Why did it occur? And how can we help prevent it in the future? So security cameras are very important. Also, audio um, recording devices, especially if things really do escalate and a, a, an operator has to hit the panic button. Uh, he really can't do much talking anymore, but he can hit a, a silent alarm, basically that uh, uh, then starts to record everything that's going on. And when that happens, supervisors and or police can then listen in and know what it is that they're responding to and be better prepared to be able to address it once they get there. And these uh, silent alarms also uh, allow for the head signs to be changed to you know, call police, the emergency. Um, and other people that see this going by can, again, with their cell phones, you know, give a call to 911 and say, hey, I just saw this um, as I was going down the street, and it might be something that you need to address. Uh, in addition to the, that other equipment, uh, annunciator systems on board vehicles uh, can be used to send some reminders to, to people on the system of some of the rules uh, or to remind them to take a look at the uh, brochure where the rules are. Uh, just as, again, one more time, they are uh, being reminded to understand what it is that's acceptable and not acceptable. And then the last one uh, that I've got listed on the screen is the automated vehicle locating systems, important for a number of reasons, but the one is that it allows the transit system to know where their vehicles are, of course, and they can dispatch a, a road supervisor as quickly as possible to a, 
uh, whatever the situation that's been called in, uh, they can get there as quickly as possible. And it's this type of thing that, again, allows the transit system to be able to tell their customers, hey, our vehicles are on time or they're a little bit late. And as long as they've got information, it helps to calm them down. They can, they can call whoever they were going to see and tell them, hey, I'm going to be a, a few minutes late. I'm sorry, I just got this message. And their anger will be reduced because they will have been forewarned and given some opportunity to take an action that, uh, that they wouldn't have without an AVL. And, and I remember, maybe some of you do too, when you're standing at a bus stop, it's a lonely feeling and you don't know when the vehicle's coming. You know it's late, but you have no idea if it would be a half an hour late or an hour late. So uh, it's a terrifically good tool to help um, de-escalate situations. Next slide. Now here, um, I guess you can call it a technology, it's equipment. And what Lori is, is going, uh, showing you here are the boundaries of a plexiglass barrier for bus operators. Um, I don't know what all of your experiences have been. I know when I first became a, a transit director, um, our first Halloween, our operators came and reported to me that, hey, you know, we got to a bus stop, there were some kids there, I opened the door, they threw a bucket of urine at him. Ridiculous, I know, horrible, disgusting, but something like this barrier would at least have protected uh, the bus operator from something like that. And there are various types of barriers. Well, I'm already showing you this one. It's sort of a, you know, it's not a full barrier, it's a partial barrier. Some of them are also, can be in Dutch door format where you can swing the top open and the bottom stays closed. <clears throat> Others are complete enclosures. And uh, we've had different reports from different transit agencies on a, as to how they were received, which I, I uh, believe we'll, we'll be talking about in a few minutes. But if we can go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, of the 41 agencies that responded to the survey, eight said that they have installed such barriers, plexiglass barriers. Uh, four others said they had installed them previously, but removed them for any number of reasons. Um, some said they felt like, oh, it, it's a barrier between me and my passengers. I don't really like that. I like to have a sense of working together and not being separated from my, my passengers. Some said they felt trapped. If something happened, they wouldn't be able to get out. Some said there was some glare at night with lights that would uh, you know, cause a glare when it hit plexiglass. Uh, others said it got a little stuffy if it was a, you know, a hot uh, weather and they, the, the air conditioning didn't work that well within it. But um, there are, as I say, a variety of designs, as we just saw, that could allow for more airflow, that allows that there isn't a complete separation. <clears throat> and uh, a number of agencies reported back saying that we're really happy that we installed them. Uh, Miami-Dade Transit, WMATA in Washington, D.C., Maryland Transit Authority, uh, all said that their operator assaults incidents had decreased noticeably uh, after installing these barriers. And I, I worked out of the Miami-Dade Transit offices for a number of years, and, and one year had 32 assaults against bus operators, uh, and then they installed these barriers, and something like 32 went from one. So for them, it was well worth it, uh, even though some operators still won't like it. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it does provide some protection for your, your uh, operators from the salt. Next, uh, next slide. In addition to um, the cameras that we talked about, uh, here's another version of it. Uh, as you look at this slide, and worry if you can use the red um, pointer, you can see a camera up there above the driver's head. And what they're looking at is the passenger that's coming on board, and the passenger on, that's coming on board can see themselves in the uh, computer monitor there, the monitoring screen. Very similar to when you go into the, some sort of convenience stores and you're, you're buying whatever you're buying, and you can see yourself on the screen. It's, it's just a great way to remind passengers that, hey, everything I'm doing here is being seen because this type of monitoring screen is not only uh, placed where you see it here as a, as a first reminder to a passenger that, yeah, they're being recorded, but you'll also see them in some systems that are located in the middle of the bus. And, uh, and so people, even as they are sitting in the bus halfway down the bus, they can see that they're being seen as well. So uh, at, at the time the report was written, these things were being tested at Long Beach Transit and at WMATA. 
But as I said, WMATA uh, had indicated that as a result of the barriers and as a result of these cameras, uh, they had re uh, reduced their assaults on operators by 30%. And they really feel that it was a, a good investment and a great thing to prevent, provide some safety to their, their uh, operators. Next slide. This is something that is probably more common throughout the uh, transit agencies today, but when I wrote the report a little over two years ago, it was, it was kind of new. Uh, this seems to be an app for everything, and there is an app for passengers who are riding on systems uh, where transit agencies have, have developed the app to um, increase the number of eyes and ears uh, on board their transit systems. And if a passenger is witnessing something that's going on uh, inside of a vehicle or at a, at a terminal, they can get their smartphone out and just use the app and report what they're seeing. And uh, doing it in real time and very quickly is something that could be extremely valuable. And, and again, valuable to anybody that's responding to this, a supervisor or, or a law enforcement officer, uh, gives them the opportunity to know what it is they're coming to and, and what they are need to be prepared for. And uh, this, I believe, is becoming more and more popular around the country. Next slide. And the last category of what agencies are doing to minimize difficult customer situations is to use law enforcement because sometimes uh, there's nothing more effective than a person with a badge on a uniform that uh, helps to discourage certain kind of behavior, uh, as you see in the picture here. And um, they obviously carry a bit more clout as well as guns, not that they're going to use them, but they, they simply have more authority than anybody else does out there. Uh, and law enforcement personnel are incorporated in different ways in, in different transit agencies, four of which said they have their own transit police that are uh, you know, fully deputized to do whatever needs to be done on their uh, transit system. Uh, others contract with local police departments, and they hire however many officers they think they need to uh, supplement whatever they already have to uh, increase security of, uh, uh, provided by police. And four smaller systems said that they, uh, at least that while they cannot afford to hire their own police, they make provisions for local police to stay at their terminal. They provide office space and communications opportunities. And at least they're there. They're there at a major terminal where 20 bus routes might be coming in and they're able to respond very quickly, uh, especially if an operator is phoned in something or, or bought in something that he says, hey, I've had this trouble with this customer. You know, I'd really like you to speak to them when we get to the terminal. And uh, some other systems, Miami-Dade Transit uh, reported they do contract with a major private security firm, he was Wacken Hut, uh, that uh, supplements the, the, the local police assistance that they do get. So, uh, Again, this is something that is very valuable, uh, especially for those cases where you're dealing with, with people that are really somewhat out of control. And you need to have stronger measures taken than one you, you could typically take as a transit personnel. Next slide. Now, there is never going to be enough funding to have a, a policeman or a policewoman on every vehicle and every station. Um, you just you can't have blanket enforcement, and so that's why the the first and most important thing is to always have bus operators that are very well trained to uh, use the very best judgment they possibly can based on the training they've received. And virtually every system said that if you really do have a well trained operator, they can handle the vast vast majority of, of all the situations they're going to be uh, dealing with, and I, and I think that's true. Uh, and, and that these bus operators and, and trained personnel uh, and others, they really uh, have been given some training in the art of de-escalation. That's one of the most important words you've you got to remember from this presentation. Uh, just don't contribute to anything escalating to higher levels. Um, in fact, the, the next bullet more or less says what one, what one of us, uh, one of the transit systems reported that he, he has the 3D system. The passengers can be either they're different, they're difficult, they're dangerous. You know, different, well, you know, maybe they, they have some OCD. Uh, that might make them a little difficult, but doesn't necessarily make them dangerous. 
uh, or if they've got a Tourette syndrome, you know, they're 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 different. <laughs> it can be a little difficult, but they're not necessarily dangerous. Whereas others can be dangerous. And the operator, as I say, is one word away from bringing that passenger to the next level up or the next level down. Uh, so you just have to be extremely um, careful with how you present yourself, how you your tone of voice, your behavior toward them, uh, showing respect even if it's not really deserve, you still have to do it. And that the operator should always default to their training as the first uh, option and uh, follow procedures uh, when they need support more than what they can do themselves. And we'll get into that uh, next. <clears throat> so the most important uh, training that, that the operators receive, and I know we've talked about this a bit, is to uh, you know, always be courteous, be patient, you're serving the public. You don't know who's coming on board that vehicle. You don't know who's coming in inside your, your facility. Uh, it's the public. And, and so you, you have to be respectful regardless of what circumstances might be in place. And to avoid, avoid, avoid confrontation at, at all costs. Just don't take it personally. It, you know, that's the thing that will help you avoid uh, confrontation. Again, these people don't know you anyway. There's no reason for you to take it personally. And to never take away a person's dignity and always give them an out. You know, don't put them into a corner. Give them an out. Give them an opportunity to back away, to tone down. And don't put yourself in the position of enforcing an ultimatum because you're going to have passengers there that ultimatums don't mean anything. You know, they might be mentally disturbed or they might be, you know, totally uh, out of it on alcohol or drugs. No amount of rational discussion is going to change them, and probably no ultimatum is going to make them change their behavior either. Next slide. So the, uh, the same procedures tend to uh, be in effect for virtually all incidents, even though there's many different kinds of situations, as we've noted in this presentation. The, uh, the first step is that, is that uh, the bus operator should try their best to keep the, the bus in service versus engaging in an argument with stopping the bus. Right? Again, I mean, part of what we're trying to do is continue to make the bus service attractive or the whatever service you're, you're providing. And when you're stopping the bus and causing people misconnections and miss their, <clears throat> wherever they're going on time, that, that, that's not a good thing. You're just going to make some more enemies, typically. Of course, if there's a really dangerous situation, that changes. And we'll get to that in a moment. But uh, the bus operator should advise the radio dispatch supervisor uh, of any situation that does get a bit out of hand. It's getting escalated. And, and ask for guidance. Now, we know that most of these personnel are seemingly out there on their own. I mean, there's nobody else with them physically, but they're never really totally alone. I mean, they've got the radio dispatch, they've got supervisors on the road, they've got uh, police that can uh, hopefully get to someplace pretty quickly but they've got to follow the right procedures to uh, get that extra assistance that they need. And if there appears to be no danger of violence, uh, then a field supervisor should be sufficient. Send out to meet the bus, uh, deal with the customer, and, and they can offer options to the passenger. You know, and they can either say, look, you can, you can get back on board, but you have to not behave in this fashion, or you can get in my car and I'll take you to where you need to go, or you can get back on the bus, but I'm going to be following the bus in my supervisor's car the rest of this trip. Things of that sort, if there doesn't appear to be a danger of violence. But if it does escalate higher than that, that's when you're going to need local law enforcement. That's something that goes beyond what a transit supervisor is paid to do. Next slide. Now, I'm sorry that it gets a little wordy here, uh, but hopefully these slides will be a benefit to you as you look at them. Uh, uh, in the future. Uh, as we said, paying or not paying fares seems to be the most frequent and uh, some say the most difficult situation. And we've already gone over that in the Q&A that uh, you know, if the operator has not seen this passenger before, they should just remind the passenger who's not paying the proper fare what the proper fare is, let them ride, suggest that they make up for it in their next trip. Uh, but if the operator knows it's a habitual offender, then call the supervisor to meet the bus and have the passenger removed. So that's how that's typically dealt with. Uh, being intoxicated, 
is not, as I say, it's not illegal to be intoxicated, and it's not really grounds to prevent someone from riding unless they're a threat to themselves or to others. And uh, typically operators are not allowed to deny service unless instructed by a supervisor. Um, I think as long as the person can stand up, if they can get on and off the bus by themselves and they're not bothering anybody, uh, it, it's, you know, it may not be the, the, the best situation in the world, but uh, it's, it's not something that you necessarily have to call the police for or even the, the supervisor, unless, unless, again, their, their behavior becomes unruly or they become disruptive. So operators have to make those judgments, and that's why the job is difficult. The, Steering a big vehicle is, is tough enough, but the toughest part of the job is being able to deal with people in their uh, various uh, forms uh, and do it fairly and do it in a way that uh, treats the person with respect but also respects the rights of the passengers that are on the vehicle. And then you have the situation with passengers with apparent mental health issues. And they're dealt with pretty much the same way as you would with someone that's intoxicated. Uh, again. The operator has to make a pretty quick judgment, make their best judgment, and determine whether or not he thinks supervisory assistance should be should be called. And um, they, if, if they are uh, requesting a supervisor, then the supervisor could take this person off of the bus, take them to their final destination if they're cognizant enough to know where they're going, or they could take them to a social service agency or a police station, or a medical facility, depending on what their condition is. But that's the, the procedures that are followed. Again, the bus operator makes the first determination. If they feel that the passenger is going to be not disruptive and just sort of sit there and travel fine, but if they think that they're going to be uh, a danger to themselves or others, call the supervisors and the supervisor and the dispatch will determine whether they also want to call police. Next slide. One that gets pretty sticky and sensitive, uh, no pun uh, intended, dealing with passengers that have open wounds or, or offensive odor or bad hygiene. Uh, typically, what's happening these days is that uh, no action is really taken unless the hygiene issue poses a threat and, then, and it's a concern to your other passengers. They might be uncomfortable, but uh, you know, as long as it isn't something where they may end up uh, catching something or getting sick, uh, because of this person on the bus, uh, then you would you would allow this person to ride. Uh, however, if they really do have open wounds, as I said, or some sort of fluids that you can see, then uh, the, you want to immediately call dispatch and might even want to stop the bus at that point. If the dispatcher directs, of course you will. And the bus, again, will be met by a field supervisor as soon as possible and passengers might well want to get off the bus, and that's, of course, a great inconvenience. Um, they would be given a, a transfer to go to the next bus, but uh, that's their choice. Uh, they can either stay on the existing bus and wait for the supervisors and police to come, or they could transfer to another bus. Fortunately, this doesn't happen every trip, uh, but it, it, it does happen, and so that's how they typically deal with that. Again, with the operator making the judgment, is this person a danger to other people? And if so, well, then I have to put the other people first and have this person, um, even though it's going to be potentially embarrassing for them, uh, have to have them either get off the bus or wait until he can be escorted off the bus. And then disruptive passengers, I think this might be one of the last uh, incidents we're talking about. Uh, here we have you know, highly energetic people, or argumentative people, uh, again, dealt with case by case. Operator makes the judgment. Uh, the operator first would remind passengers of what the rules of conduct are, what the rules of the road are, and what the consequences are if they don't modify their behavior. Again, you might want to hand out brochures. You might want to say you're being videotaped. Uh, remind them that there are consequences for your actions, but not to get into an argument about it and not to try to be the sheriff and take it all uh, in their own hands. You would, you would pull the bus over only if there is a real danger to passengers. And of course, that's in the eye of the beholder, you know, how much, how much negative energy is going on inside that bus. Uh, but they can, they are, uh, they'll, they'll call the dispatch, they'll tell what the situation is, and dispatch will help make the decision to take the bus off to the side of the road. Uh, call a supervisor who hopefully will come and they can remove the passenger or 
keep them on the bus or, or call for police to back them up. And uh, if things really do escalate into fights or something of that nature, the operator uh, properly trained can use their panic buttons, notify dispatch, change the head sign, say call police, um, and encourage people to open the doors and let them get off the bus if they want to. So again, it doesn't happen too often, but when it does, they need to be prepared. You have to have procedures that you're going to follow, and uh, hopefully they will be followed. Next slide. So this whole discussion really is a, a sort of a grand exercise in risk management, and you have to recognize that the public transportation uh, really, when you get down to it, is a bunch of strangers sharing space for a limited time with the common goal of getting to their destination safely. At least 99.9% .9 of the people are in that bus or train. Uh, but they're all humans with different perspectives and values and different levels of tolerance for certain types of human behavior. In fact, one English study did show that if people could um, be more open to understanding how other people kind of behave in their age groups or from their cultures or what have you, there'd be a lot less complaints and a lot more acceptance of behavior by other people that they may not be that comfortable with to begin with. But you know, once they've been educated to show that, hey, they, they mean no harm, uh, then they're more accepting. And they also have to know that people uh, can have bad days. Uh, they might be good people 99% of the time, but they could be having a bad day that day. Uh, although there are other people that, that do have more serious issues, personality disorders, uh, or other, some other kind of disabilities that's going to cause them to pay attention and uh, perhaps be taken, taken off the vehicle and, and provided some alternatives. Next slide. So to wrap it up here, the, um, the, the response that uh, transit agencies have, have developed, the response is, is to have these public education programs, community outreach, informing people of the, of the, the guides to riding and the, the rules of conduct, to uh, train your frontline personnel in particular, those bus operators, supervisors, customer service uh, employees, how to handle themselves, uh, and how to treat others with courtesy and respect and to always remain professional while they're doing it, not take things personally. To establish uh, rules of conduct, as we talked about for customers, which gives you the legal authority to take whatever action needs to be taken. To maximize the use of technology, it's out there um, and it's, it's been helping and it's been widely used by a number of agencies with some apparent uh, success. To have clear procedures, as we talked about in the last few slides, for what transit personnel should do when they're presented with these kind of unpleasant situations. To uh, be sure that you're utilizing law enforcement when necessary, but uh, in addition to that, to, to develop relationships with the local law enforcement community. And that's not just the police, but it might be the uh, state attorney's office, it might be the judges themselves. You really want to make sure that your personnel go to court if you're ever necessary to be able to ensure that the judge or, or uh, whoever is looking at it understands why this is important to the transit system and to your community. Uh, the transit agencies are also realizing that with some of these cases like the homeless or people with uh, you know, mental disorders of one sort or another, they need to get assistance from social service agencies. And I know the Rock Island Transit Agency keeps a long list of the social service agencies of a variety of kinds that are uh, in the community and they can help uh, passengers to, to go to a certain agency if they feel they need some help in one area or another. The, uh, they also in, uh, try to get input from their frontline personnel and if you've not done it before and you work at a transit agency, uh, I mean I always knew when I was a transit director I got my best education when I rode the buses, when I talk to the, the drivers, they're the folks that see it every day firsthand. And you need to get their input. And they're dying to give it to you. And they're dying to get some help. So uh, by all means, you know, have opportunities for um, forums to be uh, established at your agency where your frontline personnel can meet with each other and share stories and share experiences, hopefully uh, the ones that have been successful, but also the ones that weren't successful. 
And uh, another agency, I think this was, well, we talked about Canada. This was came from British Columbia. I saw this in the uh, literature research. They've, they've established a, a program <clears throat> where they take some of their operators who maybe used to work in law enforcement, used to work in emergency services, and they're now, they're now bus operators, and they get together and they counsel people, their fellow operators, who might have experienced some kind of trauma out there, one of these really bad customer uh, experiences, and they're there to help. They're a great resource for you, and you might want to take a look at what you've got already in your system to find out what kind of skills and experience your personnel have that could be useful. Uh, next slide. Um, again, getting assistance from different social service agencies, the frontline personnel. Um, that we actually have gone over most of these things. So, <clears throat> but one of the more important things to remember is to provide quality service. And if you provide quality service, then the amount of anger and complaints and, and the negative customer situations will be reduced. And so that's. Uh, one of the most important things to remember. And I think that's it, um, Lori, and, I, I, and I'm sorry if I may have taken a little too long, but if there's more time that people would like to ask questions, I'm happy to try to answer. Um, I think we have a few minutes. It's just uh, the captioner might have to go because I only reserve them for an hour and a half. So um, why don't we just jump right into the questions that showed up. Um, I'm going to do them in time order. So the first one is from Dee Bratland. Um, going back to the weapons uh, issue, he says uh, they have a prohibition on weapons. We have a rider who has a concealed carry permit. Do you know if we have to allow him to ride even though we have the no weapons rule? Well, I'm not a legal expert, so uh, don't take my word as possible. Awesome. <laughs> the best thing to do is to uh, you know, talk to your own attorneys and uh, get the answer from them. But my guess is if he's allowed a concealed weapon, he can probably bring it on. But uh, I, I don't want you to take that to the bank. I strongly encourage you to contact your attorney. Good answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cosette says, for someone who has been long-term or permanently denied and filed an appeal that was denied, what is the requirement for future consideration of restoring writing privileges? Well, I didn't get any feedback. Uh, I didn't ask that question, and I didn't get any information that, that uh, addressed it. But I think if you're permanently denied, you're, you're permanently denied. Uh, and that's something that, uh, you know, this person that was denied has to, you know, go in and make their case as best they can before they're permanently denied. Because once they are, I, I just don't think there's a real, I mean, an agency can say, hey, we have our, um, our, our system in place, we follow all our rules and regulations, and we found that you are no longer eligible to ride our system, period. Uh, and that usually is the end of it. But, um, you know, if, if they've had some change in their life that's really significant, they can make a case. I, they can always request it, but they shouldn't expect to be granted it. Okay. The next question is, uh, I'm just reading the names as they show up. It looks like it says Laragon, so that's what I'm going with. Uh, okay. They want to know which were the four agencies that installed and removed the barriers back when you were talking about the barriers. Yes, Laragon is from The Hobbit someplace. Uh, anyway, uh, I know one of them was Palmtran. Um, it's in the report, and if you, and I can't remember all these things. The report isn't terribly long, it's 60 pages, but it's uh, all of them are listed and explained as to why they chose not to continue with them. But Palmtran was one in uh, Palm Beach County, Florida. Okay, uh, Fiona, uh, well, Fiona was asking a question to someone earlier, so uh, about going back to the concealed carry laws. I think she answered similarly to what you said, Joel. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to go. Brian, uh, okay. Brian, this is not a question. I guess that was a comment. Yeah. <laughs> or actually, well, after that, Brian said, uh, what or where can you suggest we get specific de-escalation training, driver to passenger? Um, again, there are uh, the, the Transportation Safety Institute could uh, suggest some. Uh, at NTI, Maury, I'm not sure if you still um, have. That's a really good question, and I should have had that ready. We did have, 
violence, violence in the transit workplace. And I'm pretty sure I just updated. I can't remember what I do from one week to the next. Um, yeah, there, there was, there is a course, and I'm completely blanking on it and embarrassing myself in front of everybody. Um, <laughs> operator assault. There is a course on preventing operator assault that uh, NTI offers, and I believe I just made updates to it. So if you go to the NTI website, www.ntionline.com, and go to courses, um, there's a workplace safety section, or alphabetically, um, there's there should be an operator assault course on there. There's more information um, if you want. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, there, there are a lot of private companies out there that provide training of all kinds, including this type of training. Um, I, I believe that some of them are more specifically noted in the report. Again, I, I don't have a copy of the hard copy of the report with me, so I can't really dig to the page, but uh, but they're out there. Um, and, and I think the uh, Canadian Urban Transportation Association might also uh, be a, a source of training of that sort, too, or can identify what the training is. Um, that's, I think that's all the questions that were in the Q&A box, but there was something, there was a couple of things in the chat box that I noticed. Um, uh, okay, we answered Jeff's question. Nicole asked questions of the other panelists. Jeff again wrote, uh, no, he says, do not attempt to keep irate passengers on the bus, stop at a safe location, open the doors, and call for help. Would this be good protocol? Um, well, if you're irate, uh, you know, again, I think you remind the, the passenger of the rules and you, and you remind them of the cameras and you remind them that hey, we can't uh, comply. But we are going to have to call for supervisors to come here and escort you off the bus. Uh, if they get even more irate at that, which they might, then, yeah, you know, you would want to stop at a, a regular bus stop, I think. And, uh, uh advise people, depending on how much it's escalated at that point, advise people that they could get off the bus if they wanted to, but in the meantime, you will have called dispatch, you will call for supervisors, and uh, hope that they will show up pretty quickly. But we know that's not always going to happen. You know, it may take 15, 20 minutes for somebody to get there. And we know that police have what they might regard as higher priorities than dealing with something on a bus, which is too bad because they're probably dealing with more people on the bus than they are with whatever they're doing. But uh, uh, yeah, what, what uh, Jeff is saying here is, is, is not a bad idea, depending on how um, how serious the, and how irate the person has become and how much of a, not just an irritant, but a da potential danger they've become to okay. other people on the bus. Uh, Lena, Lena Aragon, that was the Laragon. I, uh. I, was, I was just pointing out that I could only read what is showing up, but I didn't know um, everyone's name. But... Mm -hmm. uh, says, FYI, the panels were not installed at Palm Tran. Uh, I work for Palm Tran. Yeah, so, and, and I, you know, Lena, I'm not sure. Um, you're doing it from memory, but, right? Well, no, I mean, I, I know that I received that response from Palm Tran. Oh. And that's the reason I would have stated it. And it may have been a number of years ago, and I don't know how long Lena's been there at Palm Tran. Um, it could be that they experimented with it on a few buses and decided against it. Uh, so I know that they never installed them fully, but it, it could be that they did try them in a sort of a, uh, you know, just a model experiment and then, then dismissed it. That's possible. Um, mm -hmm. Brian has two more questions in the Q&A box. Um, he wanted to know how many agencies practice the verbal judo method, so I don't know if that was a question for other people to respond with or if you have that information. And then uh, he asked, how do other agencies keep operators informed of banned passengers? Uh, good. Uh, last question in particular is good, and, and I know that they do. Many agencies have a you know, hall of shame where they've got um, pictures of the people that have been banned, because again, uh, a bus operator is really not allowed to deny service unless someone has been banned from the service. And the only reason that they would know who they could who they could deny service to is if they could see them and recognize them. So they do try to put pictures up saying, you know, these folks have had trespass warrants issued. They're not allowed to bypass them at the stop. And, you know, the pictures could be on the wall. They could also have them on the website. Uh, you know, a lot of transit agencies are 
going to much greater lengths to communicate with their operators uh, through email and through other ways that would allow them, uh, the operators, to go click on pictures of people in the band and uh, have a little bit better sense of, of who's banned and who isn't. But uh, wow, this is great. This, the sound effects here are terrific. <laughs> oh, I think that's, I uh, sorry, this busy street outside. I should have probably muted my, are you talking about the sirens? <laughs> yes, that's perfect. Yeah, yes, it's, um, it's on the street behind me. Something's yeah. going on. I can mute myself, I'm sorry. But anyway, um, it's, it's not easy, especially the larger the system is and the more passengers you carry. Uh, you know, these spaces tend to blend into each other, but but that's the way they typically do it. Uh, you know, they don't they don't put any kind of a uh, an item inside their neck, you know, that you can detect or that they're they're banned or anything like that. You just have to do your best to inform your operators. These are the folks that we determine are no longer eligible to use our system. Here's their pictures. Please familiarize yourself with it and and uh, govern yourself accordingly. Um, I think that was it. I'm sorry if I missed your question. Does anybody else have any questions? Feel free to type away. You can use the chat box or the Q&A box. Well, if not, uh, again, I would like to thank everyone that uh, participated today. Uh, terribly sorry if the audio wasn't as good as it could have been. Um, hopefully, though, you, you will have the ability to download these slides, but even more important, uh, if you do get the opportunity to read the report, if this subject matter is of great interest to you, there's a lot more information in the report. And as I said, usually the agency that does a certain type of action is identified. And you can follow up with them and, and get more information if you'd like by contacting them. So um, with that, Lori, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share the information. Thank you. And Thank and you. Hope that, and I hope it's been useful to those who, who participated. I think this was great. And um, I w would like to thank uh, everyone for participating. Um, oh, uh, Barbara wants to know how we view the report. Um, I, you know what? It comes up pretty quickly if you do a search for the title, um, mm -hmm. which is on, what was it, the second slide? I don't know if I could jump back there really quickly. Oh, yeah. wait, maybe I can. Uh, bear with me one second. Let's see. It's uh, TCRP. Is it one, 127? Yeah, I'm 27, sorry. Uh, addressing difficult customer situations. Oh, if there you, was. Yeah, if you Google that. It uh, comes up right away. Yeah, and then you click on that link. They will ask a couple of questions of you um, as to whether you want to view the full PDF or whether you want to just do a chapter by chapter. Uh, you you, uh, you log in, you click click on it, and they will download it for free. And you can then upload it on your screen and uh, read the report at your leisure. Oh, Beth, put thank you, Beth. Beth put the link um, in the chat box right now, uh, okay. which was great. I just I have too many windows open while running the webinar, so I, I couldn't I couldn't do that right now. So Beth, thank you very very much for doing that. Um, I guess I was I was doing my little wrap up bit here where I was thanking everyone for participating, especially okay, Beth. Okay. That was that was very handy. <laughs> uh, Could I ask him a question here? <laughs> oh, uh, of course. Can, can, is this recorded in a way that others who weren't able to be here today could be advised that hey, you can watch this if you'd like. Go to this link to, to watch. Um, yes. <laughs> it, okay. Since this is a new platform, I'm still um, working with the recordings. This is my third third webinar that I've done with Zoom, and I do have the recordings. However, I'm having um, I, I'm having issues with the closed caption so that it's um, ADA compliant, and I'm working on that. So I do have, the, I should have the recordings. I, they, there's a slight delay in getting them posted onto NTI's YouTube page. Um, if you want to see what is on NTI's YouTube page, I don't have the URL in front of me, but if you go to the main NTI website, www.ntionline.com and you scroll up at the top of the red bar at the top there's a little YouTube link and that'll take you right there um, it's it's there's a backsplash and I think it's backsplash like it's my kitchen backslash <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think it's National Transit Institute is the username but I don't want to give you the wrong it's not right in front of me so um, 
hopefully someone was able to get that information out of my babbling there. Um, I, I was just thanking everyone. I was thanking Joel for your uh, informative presentation and a reminder to everyone still listening that you will be getting an email with uh, an evaluation online survey. We would really appreciate it if you would uh, just take a couple minutes and fill that out for us. We really appreciate your feedback. And that's all I have to say. Joel, any parting words? Uh, no, uh, again, just thanks to everyone. And, uh, and I hope that it, it proves to be useful and I hope you read the report. I hope so too. This was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Bye everybody.